The limited partner shares in the potential outsized returns of a well-planned and executed investment. But as a passive investor with no day-to-day -day operating requirements, whose liability is limited to the extent of their share of ownership, the limited partner has the maximum leverage on their most precious asset, their time. Now they say you're the average of the people you surround yourself with. Are you looking to elevate your network, connect with individuals that bring your average up? The Limited Partner is more than just a podcast. It's a community to learn, to participate, to connect. There's no other community out there like this for Limited Partners. So subscribe to the podcast, but most importantly, join the community at thelimitedpartner.com. Welcome to the podcast with your host, Jake Wiley. Welcome, partners. This is your host, Jake Wiley. This week, I'm joined by Jay Scott. He's an author and host of the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. Jay, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate you having me here. Well, yeah, this is going to be a this is going to be a great conversation. I can tell already. So, I guess to start off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you end up where you are, investing, hosting the the business podcast show? Yeah, so I actually started outside of real estate. So I'm a tech and business guy by education and trade. I spent about 15 years in the corporate world uh, in Silicon Valley, working for some big companies like Microsoft and eBay. And then in 2008, I met my then soon-to-be wife, and she was also in the tech world. We were both working ridiculous hours, and we both realized that if we wanted to start a family, if we wanted to be able to focus on family, we needed to do something different than simply continuing along our corporate trajectory. So we agreed at, at the time back in 2008 that we were going to quit our jobs. We were going to move a little bit closer to family on the East Coast, and we would figure out what to do next. So 2008 comes along and we quit our jobs. We move back East and we're trying to figure out what to do next. And my wife was watching TV one day and, and there was a house flipping show on and she kind of half jokingly said, hey, while we're trying to figure out what we should do next, why don't we flip a house? And I thought she was kidding. I we had literally just bought our first house ever that we were living in. I had no real estate experience. I'm probably the least handy person you'll ever meet. But she was serious. And so I said, okay, we can give this a try. So uh, we bought a house. We actually bought two houses to begin our, our house flipping journey. And one thing led to another and we kept flipping houses. And before we knew it, that, that thing we were going to do next ended up being real estate. And here we are 13 years later and we flipped about 400 houses. We uh, About three years ago, two to three years ago, we moved into the multifamily space and we're now doing large multifamily deals. And so I, I still do a lot of stuff in the business world. I do real estate investing, business investing, other types of investing. I'm kind of, I enjoy all types of investing and yeah, here we are. You know, one thing that you said really always makes my ears perk up. You said the year 2008. And I think just, just to put that in context, if you weren't in real estate, you probably still remember it. And that's like when the wheels fell off, you know, in the world and in 2008, 2009. So I, I left my full-time job in 2009 to buy, quote unquote, when there's blood in the street, right? Because housing prices were falling. But it was a scary time. Like, don't get me wrong. There was, there's a lot that could go wrong. You know, the future was less than certain by any means at that point. I'd love to hear a little bit about your 2008, 2009 timeframe experience. You have no job, you're flipping houses. Like this is, this will be interesting. Yeah. So I was very fortunate in that I didn't know what I didn't know. I was extremely naive. I knew very little about real estate. I was well-versed in economics, but I didn't really get what was going on with real estate in 2008. And had I been a little bit better versed in, in real estate investing, I probably never would have started in 2008. But luckily, I, I was naive, and so I did jump in. And it turns out that it was actually a very good time to start. Certainly, there were its challenges. Anytime you're doing transactional type deals where you're buying something and selling something else, whether it's houses or any other type of product or inventory, it's always going to be a good time to either buy or sell, depending on whether you're in a demand part of the cycle or supply part of the cycle. Um, these days, obviously, it's really easy to sell houses. We're, we're heavily into the demand part of the cycle. And so it's hard to find houses to buy. Well, people think back to 2008 and they think, oh, well, that was a, a really tough time. Well, back in 2008, it was just the opposite. It was really tough to sell houses. And anybody that was flipping houses in 2008 will tell you about how you had to go through two or three contracts to get a buyer who could actually qualify for a loan and houses sitting on the market for literally months, uh, having to drop prices, having to do real marketing, not just stick things on the MLS. 
Uh, there were a lot of challenges on, on the sales side, but the nice thing was there were no challenges on the buy side. So I could literally, I could print out a, a listing from the MLS or, or the whole MLS and throw a dart at it and whatever it hit was probably going to be a good deal or I could make it into a good deal if I could sell it. So 2008 was really just the opposite of what we're seeing here in 2020, 2021, where one part of the transaction cycle is really tough and one part of the transaction cycle was really easy. And so it forced me to get really good at the sales and marketing side because the purchase side was easy. Over time, I obviously had to get better at the purchase side because it started to get a lot more difficult to acquire houses. But here we are 13 years later, and because I really learned about sales and marketing and, and doing quality renovations and, and really appealing to buyers back in 2008, and I learned all the acquisition stuff 2015 through now, I feel like I have a really good handle on all parts of the transaction cycle. I meet a lot of people now who are just started flipping houses the last couple of years. And because it's so easy to sell, because the values have gone up while they're holding the property, especially these days where it can take a long time to renovate a property because labor is in shortage and, and even supplies are, are difficult to get your hands on. So if it takes three, six, nine, 12 months to renovate a house, by the time you go to sell it, you could have made a whole lot of mistakes, but the market's probably saved your butt because prices have gone up. And so I see a lot of people doing renovations now, flipping now that I look and I think, eh, if they were doing this back in 2008, the quality is probably not there and the attention to details probably not there and the focus on the right buyers probably not there. And they probably would have had some trouble back in 2008. But starting back then really forced us, the people that were in the business back then, to focus on a whole different part of the business. And so um, I, I think that's given me a, a huge edge like over this entire cycle. Yeah, that can't agree with you more. Like we bought our first home investment properties in 2007. Right. So just before the wheels fall out yep. the last time. So we've gotten to see the full cycle. Right. And actually, as, as we talk about it, I just, we just sold our first two investment properties that we bought in 2007 in the past two months because of going full cycle. Now we look like geniuses, but I can tell you there is a long period of time where we were learning every day what it meant to have a quality product, how to keep a tenant in place, marketing, property management. You name it, but it is it is it is such an experience to go full cycle and see every phase of it. And then, like you, we got as a result of the market, we moved from this buy and hold strategy into a flip strategy, right? Because as the market started to swing back up, I mean, we were building equity while we were under contract, and it wasn't a lot, but the ability to buy, hold, renovate, flip, do a good job, distinguish yourself in the marketplace because a lot of people are doing it and doing it very poorly. And you could walk into you know eight out of ten homes and see the exact same Lowe's tile that was forty nine cents per square foot, and you're like, uh huh, <laughs> I know exactly what happened. So I love I love your story, and yeah, like coming full cycle now is being on the other side because this is what it felt like in two thousand and seven when the market was hot, like markets you know super competitive, finding a property. So there's 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 you know another cycle coming. I don't know when it'll be, but I, I love I love your story. I love that you jumped in. I think. The whole concept of beginner's luck, you know, when you get in yep. and you just a little bit naive and you just do it. And somehow the universe is looking out for you and says, yep, you're supposed to be here. You probably should have known a bunch of other things, but yep. <laughs> we'll get you through this. 100%. Let's transition a little bit now to multifamily, some of the bigger deals. Let's tell me a little bit about your, your transition there, what that looked like, why you did it. Yeah. So I started uh, back in 2017. I was really burned out from flipping. We had flipped about 400 houses and I was just, I was done with it. It was, it was getting tedious and stressful and uh, the market was getting tougher, harder to find deals, harder to actually renovate them because contractors were getting difficult. And, and so we're still making money, but I just didn't feel like doing it anymore. So 2017 going to 2018, I actually spent a lot of time focused on non-real estate efforts. So started a couple of businesses, was doing some advisory work, investing outside of real estate. And what I found was because I stopped flipping houses, I had all this cash that I was using to flip houses that I now needed to find a home for. So I had been investing in multifamily syndications for a while, but I really started to ramp that up in 2017 when I had all this cash I was sitting on. And what I realized quickly was that I'm a control freak. And while there are a lot of great syndicators out there, a lot of great multifamily operators out there. I like having control. 
And I don't just like handing my money over and letting somebody else kind of decide if it's going to make money for me or not make money and how much. And so 2018 rolls around and I'm thinking, well, I like the multifamily space. I, I think from a macroeconomic standpoint, multifamily has a good bit of runway. I also was thinking that I have all this cash that I want to invest in and I want to find the right types of deals to invest uh, it in. And so the natural progression for me was, why don't I figure out how to do multifamily so that I could, one, I could find something back in real estate because I like real estate. I just was, I wasn't enjoying the single family. So it allowed me to work back in real estate on the active side, but it would also allow me to invest on the LP side as well uh, alongside my investors. And so 2018, I, I started doing some research on multifamily. What I realized was that multifamily wasn't something that I was going to learn on my own. Certainly, I could learn it on my own, but I wasn't going to be comfortable enough to start taking money from friends and family and other investors and investing it without the help of somebody that's done this before, either partnering with somebody or getting mentored by somebody that I, I really knew and trusted before I started taking money from others. So I kind of started going through my Rolodex and seeing who I knew. And, and I landed on, there was, a, there was a woman named Ashley Wilson. And Ashley and I had kind of been friends since 2014, 2015. She had been doing uh, some big multifamily, had been very successful. And so I decided to reach out to her. And I, I basically went to her with this offer. I said, look, I really want to learn multifamily. You've got a great reputation. You seem to know what you're doing. I will volunteer a year of my time to your business if you'll teach me the business and you can have access to my networking, have access to me. I'll, I'll work, I'll scrub the floors, I'll do spreadsheets, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just let me follow you in the deals you're doing and kind of teach me along the way. And so she jumped at that opportunity. I jumped at that opportunity. So uh, 2019 rolls around and, and she agrees to, to kind of mentor me for a year. So we worked together for pretty much, I guess, almost a year and, and a deal comes along that I was heavily involved in on the acquisition side. And she basically said, hey, we have the deal. I know we're coming up on the year, but how about if how about if you partner with us on this deal and you can help with underwriting, you can help with due diligence, you can help with a, a bunch of other things, you can get equity in return and, and basically can be your first real deal that you're doing. And I said, absolutely. Sounds great. This was a week before COVID hit that we got this property under contract. We're ready to fly out to do due diligence. And unfortunately, we had to cancel the flight and we canceled the contract. And we basically said to the seller, look, this was end of February, 2020. And we said, look, we're, we're really sorry. We'd love to move forward. Let's, let's reconvene in a couple of months when we kind of see how all this shakes out. So a couple of months go by, June of 2020 comes around. Everything's kind of normalizing a little bit. And it looked like the world wasn't necessarily going to collapse. And so we reached back out to the seller and we said, hey, we, we'd love to move forward with that deal. And he said, great, I, I haven't done anything. I've kind of been waiting as well. And so we picked up the contract right where we left off. It was 152 unit in, in Houston, Texas. September of 2020, we close on that deal. It was not an easy deal. I mean, every deal has its challenge, but has its challenges, but it was beginning of COVID. And so it, it, was, a, it was stressful and raising money was stressful and all of it was stressful, but it ended up closing. And at the end of the deal, Ashley and I kind of looked at each other and said, you know, we worked really well together. We have a set of very complementary skills. There are things she's really, really, really good at that I'm not. And there are things that I'm really, really, really good at that she's not. And between the two of us, we just made a, a great team. And so beginning of 2021, she came to me and she said, look, I know we had talked about working together for a year. We did this deal together. Would you consider coming on and joining my company, Bar Down Investments, uh, as a partner and we can kind of work together and, and took me about two seconds to decide that that was a great opportunity. So beginning of this year, I joined Bar Down Investments as a partner and Ashley and I are, are now partners and, and we're, we're starting to do a lot more deals and, and we're scaling the business. That's an awesome story. And one of the things that sticks out when I think about the audience of the show is, is limited partners. And it is an objective to be passive, right? Real estate is not, you can't be a quasi active investor, right? Like you're either active or you're passive because being really truly active and in the market is a full time gig, right? And, and I think for you, coming from an active environment, I can see the stress of like not being in control. Yep. Whereas you knew the business, you knew this is something that you were always passionate about. But for your average kind of 
you've got another job guy that's saying, I need to put this money to work. They need to find people like you, right? And, and that's where I think the magic happens, right? Is that how do they get comfortable you know, finding the right operating partner, general partner to work with? Yep. Because unlike you, most of the folks that are in my audience aren't looking for another full-time gig. And like, yep. let's be perfectly honest. Like, if you were going to try and do it, it is a full-time job. <laughs> yeah, it's it's difficult. And I liken kind of investing in syndications, anything passively, to being in a relationship. Too often we we jump in with both feet and later we look back and we say, that was a mistake. Why did I do that? And so what I, I like to tell everybody that's starting to look at passive investing is don't be scared to build relationships. Don't be scared to take your time. Don't be scared to like ask lots of questions. I mean, we get investors all the time that come to us and say, hey, I'd, I'd love to learn more about your deal. I don't want to ask too much because I'm probably not ready to invest. And I'm like, no, that's now's the time to ask all the questions. You don't want to start asking questions after you invest. That's right. Ask me as many questions as you want. And then when I do my next deal, ask a lot of questions then. And when I do the next deal, ask me a lot of questions then. And at some point, whether it's three months from now, six months from now, or five years from now, hopefully you'll be ready to invest and you'll come invest with us. But don't wait until after you invest to to start really digging in. I mean, and, and again, the, the whole relationship analogy, too many of us, we jump into relationships and then it's like, we're a year or two in and we're like, how did I get here? Why didn't I kind of feel things out better before I jumped in? And so, yeah, I, I would encourage anybody that's looking to, to start investing passively. Don't be scared to date around and do your due diligence and ask lots of questions and talk to the syndicators, if they won't jump on the on, on a Zoom call with you for a half hour, an hour to answer questions and, and basically get to, to know you, well, they may not be the right fit for you unless you're not looking for the relationship and all you care about is the numbers. So yeah, find, find those syndicators who have the same personality that you have and that are willing to provide you whatever it takes for you to be comfortable. Yeah. You, you're bringing up a great point because it is, it is a marriage for a while, right? Is Unlike probably what most folks are used to having a brokerage type relationship for stocks is that you always know one, you could sell them two, you can switch, right? Like that's not overly complicated to do. Like you can take your money and you can move it somewhere else. When you get into real estate, I mean, you've got to be realistic that it's five, seven, possibly 10 years that your investment is illiquid. There may be ways out of it. It's probably not super straightforward and it may not you know, be as appealing as just pulling your money out of like one stock and moving it to somewhere else. So the time to ask, the time to date is before you make a commitment, because once you're in, you know, like you should assume you're in for a while. Is that fair? Yeah. I I mean, I know this is a snarky comment, but when you get divorced, you're probably going to lose half your money. Uh, You get into (laughs) a bad syndication, you can easily lose all of your money. So in a way it's financially, it's, it's probably more risky than, than a marriage. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's just like, you're kind of helpless, right? Especially because yeah. somebody else is in control. Yep. And, you know, rightfully so. The way these investment opportunities, there's a reason there's a general partner and a limited partner. And there's a lot of benefits for that. And I think too, like there's a lot of economic benefit, benefits for a limited partner, especially holding through the investment cycle. You know, the returns are very attractive. But you know the, the control mechanism is heavily weighted in the general partners, and there's generally ways that you can vote somebody out if you have to. Yep. But if you get to that point, you're you're, you're going down a, a, an interesting path that you don't want to take. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, for me, communication is the key to a good investing partnership uh, as an LP. And so I know when I go into a deal, I want transparency. I want communication. I want to know what's going on, even if it's bad. Don't hide the bad stuff, especially the bad stuff. I, I will assume everything's going well um, unless I hear something. And so if, if, if there's bad stuff, I want to hear it because I, I want to be able to prepare and, and mitigate. And so I kind of take what I like on the LP side and I kind of apply that on the, on the GP side. I, one of our core values for our company is communication and transparency. And so basically that's, that's kind of my goal because I've, I've been on the LP side for a long time. My goal as a GP is to kind of fix all the things that I see wrong on the LP side. And communication and transparency is one of the big ones. I'm kind of torn here because I have a question and then also kind of a statement question. I'll start with my statement question. So what I've learned 
through all of my conversations is one of the biggest mistakes people have made is underestimating the importance of, of investor relations, right? Which would be communications. Yep. And I think especially for newer partnerships, you know, the, you know, this, this goes out to VC too. Like everybody wants to be like, I got this, I got this, right? Like I can take the humps and weather the storm and like, we'll come out on the other side and it's going to be okay. And therefore like there's a tendency to under communicate when things aren't going well and the tendency to over communicate when things are going great. And, you know, the, the lesson that's been learned is that just communicate it all. Everybody knows, especially folks that have done investments like this before, that not every month is going to be great. Not everything is going to be roses and sunshine. And therefore, like communicating that you had a bad month is not necessarily a problem. It's like, okay, cool. You know, like we didn't have a great month. Where's a plan to fix it? You know, like I just need to stay on top of it. That's great. What's not okay and what really causes issues is when you have a bad month and they don't find about it, find out about it until three or four months down the road when it becomes a situation you can no longer not share. Yep. That's one of the nice things about transparency is that a little bit of transparency is going to force you to have more transparency, which is going to force you to have more transparency. So one of, one of the things we do is, and I know a lot of operators do this, but a lot of them don't, is every quarter we make the full financials for our properties available to our investors. They see the P&L, they see the balance sheet, they know every penny that's coming in and going out. And so if in April, I give them the first quarter balance sheet and they saw that January was bad, but I didn't tell them in January or February that we were having issues. Well, they're going to see it in April and they're going to be, why have you been lying to me for, for two or three months? And so I know that with quarterly financials and quarterly financial calls with our investors coming up, that I need to stay on top of communication. And if there's something bad, I need to tell them now because they're going to find out about it in a couple months and that only makes it worse. And so what I like to tell other operators is like, add a little bit of transparency as you go. Just keep adding some transparency because that'll keep forcing you to add more. And before you know it, you're fully transparent. And yeah, it makes for some hard conversations. But again, you're always going to have the hard conversations when something bad happens. Pushing it off doesn't make it easier. It just makes it harder. Yeah. And I think that maybe really to put a nail on the head here is when you're dating, quote unquote, with potential partners here, you know, look for somebody that's going to tell you how it is. And like, you should be able to sniff that out really quickly. Like if it's all a sales pitch and it's all a book and it's all, you know, hockey stick type growth, yep. you know, that's probably not going to be a good fit because that's not life. But when you have somebody that's like, look, here's the opportunity. This is what we see it. This is what's attractive to it about, you know, attractive to us about this. This is why we're putting our own money into it. And again, here are the risk, right? And there's obviously like the PPM stuff where you're supposed to disclose all the risk. But I think when you, when you have that clarity up front, like you'll know that somebody's got a real plan and they're thinking through what could be coming of this thing. Yep. Yeah. And, and we're big fans of, we invest in all of our deals and we got into this business for one of the reasons was because we were looking for a place to, to put some of our cash as well. And so it, it, that's another thing that really helps us like empathize with our investors. Our latest deal, core GP team, the three of us, we're putting in $2 million into the deal. We are at this point, probably the second largest investor in the deal. And so I know that any bad news that I have to deliver to my investors, that's bad news that's coming to me as an investor as well. And again, I know I want that information. I need that information because that helps me sleep better at night knowing that, that we have that information and we can start to mitigate it. And so, yeah, I, I suggest for anybody that has the means, and not everybody does have the means, but if you're an operator and you have the means to invest alongside your investors, definitely invest alongside your investors. At very least, if you can't afford to put in your own cash, at least be taking some economic risk. Our LPs like to hear hey, we're not going to take an acquisition fee on this deal if we don't invest in it ourselves. Why should we like get compensated in fees um, if we're not risking our, our own money? Or maybe we're going to give you a higher pref, or maybe we're going to give you a better split. There are lots of things you can do as an operator where you can align your incentives with your, with your LPs, even if you can't put a bunch of money in the deal. And that's what LPs want to see. They want to see that you're sharing the risk, that your incentives are aligned. If you're collecting a lot of fees up front, if the split is low, if you have all of these crazy waterfalls that allow you to make more money every day, LPs aren't going to want to invest with you because you don't have a lot of skin in the game. You don't have a lot to lose if they don't do well. They want to hear, 
I don't get paid as an operator unless my LPs get paid first. And so figure out how to align your interests, figure out how to ensure that your LPs get paid first, or at least that, that um, you as an operator are sharing in the, in the risks. Yeah. And I think probably along those lines is you also want to make sure your operator can survive, yeah. <laughs> you know, because it is a long hold. And if they're yeah. getting paid second, like how are they going to make sure that the portfolio, the assets are getting the attention that they need? So there is acquisition fees and there are reasons for that. And there may be ways that the operator can put the acquisition fees toward something Absolutely. Similar, similar to what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I would suggest to any operator out there, and as an LP, you should be looking for this. If the operator can't invest their own money in the deal, at least be investing some of the, the acquisition fees. Right. Um, take, take something and put it in the deal. Also, as an LP, look and see what the reserves are, because you just mentioned a really good point that, that a deal needs to support itself. And typically, if a deal runs into financial issues, the last kind of lever you want to pull is a capital call. That's right. Is asking your LPs to put in more money. Sometimes that's necessary, but I want to see as an LP, I want to see that there are other things that can be done before you ask me for more money. So when I'm reading a PPM, I want to see that the, the operating reserves are reasonable and maybe even a little bit more than reasonable. Typically, as, as operators, we don't necessarily want to raise more money than we have to because that dilutes the pool. But raising a little bit of extra money in operating reserves, even if it's going to sit in a bank account at a half a percent interest, that helps me as an LP sleep a little bit better because I know that if there's a cash flow issue, that can be covered through the operating reserves. Likewise, I want to see in the PPM that there are other things that an operator can do prior to pulling that capital call lever. So maybe the operating team can put in a loan and, or maybe the operating team can bring in additional investors to dilute. We're really careful for all of our PPMs. We basically say we do no mandatory capital calls. If we have to ask for more money from our investors, number one, we'll work out of our operating reserves until that's not feasible. Number two, we have the, the, the right as the operating team, we can put a loan or we can invest our own money into the deal to keep it afloat. And so we'll always make a loan to the company before we ask for a capital call. But if it does get to the point that we make a capital call, it's always going to be a voluntary capital call. So if an LP doesn't want to or can't put more money in, they'll get diluted because we have to bring in additional investors, but they're not going to get penalized. We don't require them to put money in. And as an LP, I mean, and as an LP, you need to decide like what you want to invest in. But as an LP, I like that. I like knowing that I'm never going to be forced to put money in because if I have money across, let's say, 20 different syndications, and then we run into like a 2008 type event or a COVID type event where all 20 of those syndications suddenly do a capital call all at once. And I need to come up with two or $3 million to satisfy all these capital calls. That could put me in a really bad spot. So I'd much rather see that each deal has the ability to mitigate before asking me for a capital call. And if they do have to ask me for a capital call, I have the right to say no. Yeah. And I think just to maybe frame this out, if if you're looking at an operating agreement and there is no reserves or the reserves are razor thin, that means that this property has to run almost perfectly to the projections, which you know very well may happen, but it very well may not. Yep. And in the event that it doesn't, and there's a cash flow shortage, we're not going to lose the property. So the cash has got to come from somewhere. So for those of you out there that, that have properties that could have assessments, HOAs, it's like having a surprise assessment. Yep. levied on you, right? And like, there's really nothing that you can do about it. So I think it's just something really important to look at to know that, is there a good operating reserve to get you through an interesting cycle? Because they could yep. happen. And if there's not, that's kind of a red flag that you, you might want to either ask that question and just see if there's a way that you can go back. But if you have a property that's got a good operating reserve, it's got a good return profile, like these are really good things to be looking for in your investment portfolio. Yep. And, and if you know about real estate, if you know how to look at a, a P&L, if you know how to look at a, a, a deal underwriting, there are all kinds of questions you should be asking. I mean, everything from what is your break-even ratio? So for example, for a particular property, how much vacancy can we have on this particular deal before cash flow goes negative and the property right. can't support itself? If that number is 50%, that's great. I'm typically not worried about a, a property that's currently at 90% occupancy dropping to 50%. If that's 85, well, then I'm a lot more concerned because an 85% break-even ratio, it's very possible that we could have like a COVID type event. We see vacancies spike. 
And now suddenly the, the property can't pay for itself. And so asking for things like what's the break-even ratio and, and other just basic PL type questions and underwriting type questions can give you some insight into how flexible a deal is and how poorly things can go before the deal can no longer support itself. And, and just it's like running your own sensitivity analysis on the underwriting, because a lot of times the operators aren't going to do that for you, not necessarily because they want to hide it from you, but they aren't necessarily doing that for themselves. Yeah. And just to put that in perspective for you guys out there listening, in today's market, so this is the end of 2021, going into 2022, uh, the property values are very high. Cap rates are very low. So that is something you need to be looking for, right? Like yeah. this is a very real thing that you need to be looking at is that you know, the break-even ratio might be pretty tight. So yeah. look at that. And if it is, right, that's what reserves are for. And if there's adequate reserves, great. Then that's the layer of cushion that you're looking for. And then also, I mean, as long as we're talking about sensitivity analysis, it's the same on, on the on the like total profits from the deal. So one thing that I'm starting to see more of, but I want to see a whole lot more of it from from the deals I'm investing in, I want to see the sensitivity analysis on, on cap rates. So basically, if I'm going into a deal, what's pretty typical these days is if the market cap rate is let's say five percent the day you buy the property, um, we generally model about a tenth of a of a of a point in cap rate expansion every year until sale. So if we buy a property at 5% cap rate and we're going to hold it for five years, the model that most syndicators use is that they'll assume one-tenth of a, of a percent per year increase in cap rate. So at five years, it's going to be a 5.5% cap rate exit. But we don't know what cap rates are going to do, what interest rates are going to do over the next five years. They can continue to go down. They can go up two points. And that's kind of the, the wild card these days. So what I want to see when I'm looking at a deal is I want to see, we expect a, let's say, a 15% IRR, just to use an example on a deal, assuming we can sell it at a 5.5% cap rate. Well, show me what happens if it's a 5.6% cap rate when we sell. How does that impact it? Does it go to a 14% IRR, a 7% IRR? What if it jumps to a 6% cap rate or down to a 4% cap rate? And how does my return get impacted by a change in cap rates? Likewise, operating income. So we're starting to see rents go through the roof, but we're also starting to see expenses go through the roof. So it's getting a lot harder to model net operating income and to say, in three years, we expect our net operating income to be X, and in five years, we expect it to be Y. So show me the sensitivity analysis. When we get to year five, when we plan to sell, if net operating income is 5% less than what we expected, how does that impact my returns? If net operating income is 3% less and cap rates are 0.2% more, how does that impact my returns? And I want to see kind of these levers as, as, as they get pulled and changed how that's going to impact my returns, because I kind of want to know how bad do things need to get before I'm losing money. And I think I think like a lot of LPs where capital preservation is, is just as important as making a profit. I want to know how bad can things get before I start losing money on this particular deal, because some deals, tremendous upside, but just a little bit of downside, you're going to lose money. Other deals, eh, not so much upside, but there's not a lot of risk. Even, even a good bit of downside, you're not going to lose money. And so as a, as a limited partner, one, you need to know what your risk profile looks like. Are you looking for super upside and willing to take a, a big risk? Are you looking for just a little bit of upside, but you don't want much risk? And then make sure the deal actually supports that risk profile that you're looking for. That's great advice. Great advice. Well, my final question, I always wrap up the show, and I, I feel like I might know where you're headed with this already, is about gratitude. We don't get to where we are without somebody helping us along the way. And it's probably a bunch of people. But is there anybody specifically you'd want to give a, a shout out to here on the show to say thank you for giving you the leg up when you needed it most? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do two. So I'm going to start with number one, my wife, most supportive person that, that I've ever met in my entire life. We were partners and we did uh, single family residential flipping rentals together for 10 years. And, and I mean, we, we did literally every day, we would spend 12 hours a day together working and she was always supportive. And then kind of when I went off into the, the multifamily world, she decided she kind of wanted to step back and play more of a stay-at-home mom type role. And, and yet I'm still out there every, every day working with my new partners and, and she continues to support me now as much as ever. So um, certainly like having the best spouse in the world has made being in this industry and this business a whole lot easier. And then number two, I've already mentioned her, but Ashley Wilson, who basically gave me the opportunity to jump into multifamily, gave me 
uh, the background gave me the team that I could plug myself into uh, in a way that I'm basically taking zero risk. I mean, when I first started, I was terrified to do that first deal, especially taking other people's money. But she gave me the opportunity to kind of plug into her team to the point where there was zero risk, where there was as little risk as, as possible. And so she gave me that opportunity. And, and so just uh, so grateful to her to, to kind of be willing to, to drag me along and pull me up and, and eventually make me a partner in her business. That's awesome. Well, Jay, this has been a great conversation. I learned a ton. And as I just really appreciate your time and thanks for being on the show. Yeah, absolutely, Jake. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Limited Partner Podcast. Please subscribe and leave a review. If there's any reason you wouldn't leave us a five-star review, please email me directly at jw at jakewiley.com. Your feedback is always appreciated. Now, the show is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the limited partner community. It's a community where limited partners can come together, learn about what best in class looks like, opportunities, and most importantly, a place to connect. There is nothing out there like this. So head over to thelimitedpartner.com and sign up. We'll see you next time.